This episode is sponsored by Audible. The Universe is a vast and ancient place where we hope to find life besides our own. We often speculate about alien life and how it might differ, including life which might operate on entirely different chemistry than our own, but how realistic is that? Almost since we began seriously contemplating life on other worlds, we speculated that perhaps it might not run on chemistry similar to our own. We'll be examining some of those alternative chemistries today, particularly silicon, as well as some totally different approaches to life which might avoid chemical fuel in favor of something like running on direct sunlight by photovoltaic power, or even stranger sources like lightning on storm-wracked worlds or on geothermal power. I want to say from the outset though that these are probably real realities we're discussing today. Life needs power to run on and raw materials that are amenable to being rearranged into complex living forms. The combination of sunlight, carbon compounds, and water fits those needs amazingly well, and plants the right distance from their sun tend to be places where carbon and water are plentiful, so for life to form based on those ingredients is far, far more probable than the alternatives we'll discuss today, or appears to be. On the other hand, when discussing improbabilities, we always have to remember that the Universe is fairly large. With 10 to the 24 stars in the observable Universe, if an event is so rare it can only happen in one stellar system in a quadrillion, it's already happened about a million times, just among the galaxies we can see. But exactly how improbable these alternative life forms are is impossible to say. Life on Earth is still the only example we know of, of life in any form, so any statistical estimates we make on the topic will come with very wide margins of uncertainty, and simulating an entire stellar system down to the level of detail of individual pools of organic molecules forming on various bodies is an immense computational task, so we won't be doing statistical studies on simulated universes any decade soon. As we discussed in the episode Why Life Exists, We have some reason to think that life tends to pop up any place with a decent energy flux and a soup of the right components mixing together, but we don't actually know much about the conditions or ingredients of the primordial soup that we ourselves emerged from, let alone what else our soup could have formed if it had been a bit different. We mentioned sunlight, carbon, and water as great ingredients for easy formation of life, but carbon and water aren't necessarily plentiful every place with a big power influx. Hotter plants offer plenty of energy but they are less likely to have liquid water. One of the reasons silicon-based life is considered a likely possible alternative to carbon-based life is that silicon compounds can withstand temperatures we expect to find on hot planets similar to Mercury or near geothermal vents like those in our oceans and on Jupiter's moon Europa. But before we dig very deep, we should clarify exactly what we mean by that term, silicon-based life. An artificial intelligence running on processors built from silicon wafers could reasonably call itself silicon-based, but not in the way we are talking about in this episode, though we will discuss some parallel scenarios later. We build computer processors on silicon wafers because silicon crystals have some very useful electrical properties that are easy to change to suit our engineering needs. Crystalline silicon is the simplest of a class of materials called semiconductors, meaning the crystal conducts electricity like a metal under certain circumstances, but becomes an insulator like glass under others. And we can adjust these conductive properties by doping the silicon, which means adding trace amounts of other elements. This is what makes it possible to create silicon electric components that conduct electricity differently depending on the direction, temperature, or light levels, and most importantly to use a control signal to amplify another or shut off another electrical signal in other words, to make transistors, which are the whole basis of modern digital computers. But those are all the properties of silicon crystals, and the silicon-based life we are talking about at the moment makes use of an entirely different chemical properties of silicon that appear not when it's bound to itself in a crystal, but when it's bound to atoms of other elements in a molecule. Silicon appears right beneath carbon on the periodic table of elements, because they both have four electrons in their outermost electron shell available to form four chemical bonds with other atoms. If you look at the atomic structure of any stable carbon-containing molecule, you'll see the carbon atoms all have four bonds, 
Compounds like carbon monoxide, in which the carbon has three bonds with the oxygen, are highly reactive because the carbon would be so much more stable if it could just form a fourth bond with something. Silicon has eight more electrons than carbon, one more full shell, but still four in its outermost or valence shell, which is available for bonding. So nearly every simple carbon containing molecule has a silicon analog, but not all of those analogs exist on Earth or in nature. Silicon is a larger, heavier atom than carbon, and having the same number of bonds doesn't mean the bonds have the same strength or function in the same way, so analogous molecules often have very different properties. For example, silane is a silicon atom bound to four hydrogen atoms, the analog of methane, and it has very similar properties to methane apart from being twice as dense and boiling at negative 169 Fahrenheit or 161 Kelvin instead of negative 259 Fahrenheit or 112 Kelvin. Silicon dioxide gas has the same molecular structure as carbon dioxide, but its boiling point is over 5000 degrees Fahrenheit hotter, so we usually only see it in its crystalline form, quartz. Carbon dioxide can form the same crystalline structure as quartz but only at extremely high pressures and frigid temperatures, and silicon monoxide is even less stable and more reactive than carbon monoxide, so if you heat it up enough to turn it into a gas it turns into silicon and silicon dioxide rather quickly. So when we look at the long, elegant chains and complex structures that carbon forms in organic molecules, we can expect to find analogs to most of them, but the analogs will have similar yet different chemical properties. But there are some carbon compounds that don't have silicon analogs, and vice versa. If silicon-based life exists, the chemical process on which it is based won't all have direct carbon-based analogs either, but it is reasonable to expect that under the right conditions, natural selection can develop uniquely silicon-based processes as well as it did for carbon. Loosely speaking, everything involving such silicon analogs would take more energy to do it. If every bond change takes a little more energy, it makes creating something complex and dynamic and shifting that much harder and disadvantaged. Which may be why you'd get carbon-based life even where silicon was more plentiful, it's just cheaper to run to achieve the same effect. Now as mentioned, Earth's crust has more silicon than carbon, and you might be wondering why. Carbon is a lot more plentiful than silicon in the Universe, the fourth most abundant element after hydrogen, helium, and oxygen and carbon is about seven times more plentiful than silicon, but silicon is the second most abundant element on Earth's crust, right after oxygen, and almost everything we call dirt or rock or sand or water is some mix of one or both, whereas carbon is a lot more rare. In the Universe at large it may be seven times more plentiful than silicon, but in the crust it's the other way around and then some, there is hundreds of times more silicon than carbon. Silicon tends to remain at the surface of a molten protoplanet and linger, floating up top, while carbon bonds to plenty of things, like iron to form steel and in big complex organic molecules. There's plenty of carbon inside Earth, but it's way down, not much is near the surface. Interestingly, a world more massive than Earth might have even less crustal carbon because the same geological forces and interactions that pulled the carbon down on Earth and sequestered it from the crust might have been a good deal stronger. Same for a hotter world too perhaps, where silicon would likely work better than carbon for many complex chemicals and macromolecules. In such cases, if silicon life is possible just less preferred than carbon, things that lower available carbon or make carbon life less viable might allow silicon life to emerge. The same applies to other hypothetical chemistries we'll get to, because fundamentally even if carbon is the optimal path to life, It doesn't matter in places where the conditions don't permit it, either from an absence of carbon or temperatures, pressures, or radiation that interfere with organic carbon chemistry. One problem of note, while we call ourselves carbon-based, almost all of our mass is actually water. Now water is plentiful enough, it's probably the most common molecule in the Universe after stuff like monoatomic helium and diatomic hydrogen. But actual water is a very small part of that abundance, in favor of ice or gas. You can only have liquid water in a fairly narrow window of pressure and temperature and most plants aren't likely to have liquid water oceans under a thick atmosphere. Water, due to its immense abundance and its reputation as a universal solvent due to its polar nature, is ideal as the primary medium of life 
because so many things dissolve in it and there's so much of it. Not everything dissolves in water of course, nor would a liquid need to be a great solvent, just capable of dissolving the key elements for a given alternative biochemistry to carbon. Silicon dioxide, also a very abundant substance, has a very large range of temperatures it can be liquid, but it's a high one, hot inner planet or subterranean molten temperatures, like in the lower crust or mantle of a world, which is an option for life too. Hypothetical alternate chemistry for this or molten silicate rock would likely involve silicon and oxygen of course, and quite possibly aluminum. Sodium chloride or salt is another high temperature solvent option. Another decently plausible liquid would be supercritical carbon dioxide, though this would seem to favor carbon abundance in the medium, or supercritical hydrogen, which is obviously going to be abundant inside any gas giant and possibly super-Earth or mini-Neptune planets, which we've some reason to believe will be very common elsewhere than our own solar system. Hydrogen sulfide should be abundant and is the closest chemical analog to water, though a poor solvent, but may be abundant below the surface on more volcanic worlds like Jupiter's moon Io. Tidally racked moons of cold and distant gas giants are decently plausible candidates for life as they could have abundant subsurface oceans of water or something else, just as another of Jupiter's moons, Europa has. That life might be fueled by tidal power as opposed to sunlight, and it's worth remembering that photosynthesis came after life on Earth, which we have good reason to think developed around geothermal oceanic vents anyway. Sunlight is a vastly superior power source but you work with what you got, and most of the planets and moons in the Universe ain't got much of it, so may have to use alternative power sources. Warmth helps life but sunlight isn't the only source for that. Most of the Universe is rather cold too, and far from suns we might see liquid nitrogen or hydrogen as a possible liquid medium for life, as might be hydrogen fluoride, ammonia, or methane liquid. Hydrogen fluoride isn't good for Earth-based life but is stable with paraffin waxes, so you might have some amusing equivalent to wax dolls as a life form somewhere. Methane solvent life might be plausible on places like Saturn's moon Titan, using acrylonitrile, an organic compound of carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, which we believe to be decently abundant on Titan and large cord moons like Titan are likely to be fairly abundant in the Universe. There's also plausible options for hydrogen chloride, sulfuric acid, which is prevalent in Venus's atmosphere, formic acid, nitric acid, and methanol. Note how many are commonly known as acids, again what you're looking for in a medium for life is probably a liquid that dissolves stuff to permit a soup, we should not assume that is an absolute requirement though. Organoboron chemistries, those based on boron, might be plausible, but are a good example of abundance mattering. There's not much boron out there, and places it would tend to concentrate would also tend to have plenty of alternative elements. It's also explosive in Earth's atmosphere, and while more stable in a reducing environment, you'd presumably only get that in a place heavy on those other elements. As we mentioned, silicon is rarer than carbon, though only by an order of magnitude and its chemical properties allow it to stay near the surface of a world where carbon might get removed. Not so for boron. Its elemental abundance in the Universe is many thousands of times less than carbon or silicon, this stuff is almost as rare as lithium and even rarer than phosphorus. It's not hyper-rare like a lot of heavier elements, but would be a good example of a substance where even if life by it is possible, unless you can find some natural process that would tend to either make it more locally concentrated or remove other more abundant substances from play, you wouldn't expect life to result from it except by artifice in a laboratory. Which is a fair point too. As we mentioned near the beginning, we might consider computers or artificial intelligence to be life and silicon-based life, just not naturally evolved. We're going to dip into some of the stranger scenarios in a moment, like how that might occur naturally, but there may be occasions where we, or some alien civilization, might create life based on improbable foundations, either because it worked well for a purpose or simply out of curiosity. If you can do it in a lab, it can theoretically occur in nature, albeit so improbable to occur naturally that it's considerably less likely than not to ever happen naturally even once in this entire Universe. Of course we're not necessarily limited to discussing this Universe, and if many worlds interpretation of quantum is right about multiverses, you probably would have every conceivable chemistry spawn life, 
see the Infinite Improbability Issues episode for more discussion of that, nor would we be limited to universes that were the same as our own just with different timelines, possibly having different strengths of the fundamental physical forces, or even different forces, different elements, and so on. You could potentially have atoms, and thus chemicals in life, forming around strange or charm quarks rather than up and down ones as most matter in this universe has, or even life emerging in places with more than three physical dimensions. We will bypass that for today, though you can also see the Boltzmann Brain and Anthropic Principle episode for some of those scenarios. But back in our own mundane universe, we are left with the notion that the two most critical things for life are a decent concentration of matter and a source of energy. As we said a bit ago, that need not be sunlight, even liquid might not be needed in a classic sense. Many worlds are probably wracked with storms and lightning, and we might imagine something like a natural lightning rod popping up in such places, or life that ran on electricity as opposed to classic organic chemistry. As we looked at in the recent episode Why Life Exists, there are some theories that life will tend to pop up inevitably as a physical consequence of energy flux, so I could imagine some storm-wracked mineral-rich world getting its surface shot through with conductors and semiconductor crystals as some sort of natural computer. You could conceivably get natural formation of superconductors too. We don't know of any room temperature superconductors yet, hopefully there are some, but of course that's Earth's room temperature. Lots of cold planets and moons are cold enough for known superconductors. Natural or organic or quasi-organic conductors or semiconductors could also offer life a photovoltaic pathway for energy, as opposed to chemical photosynthesis, leaves that were instead solar panels and that might be a good deal more efficient and durable. We already mentioned how tidally powered environments might be common on moons of gas giants, but we could also see nuclear-based life. Even ignoring that we have some gamma-trophic life forms we found at places like Chernobyl, we have good reason to believe Earth used to have weak natural fission reactors, where a good amount of uranium was present, and younger worlds or those that possibly got smacked by a uranium-rich extrasolar asteroid from some younger system might have life emerge powered by that. Presumably it wouldn't have a problem mutating under the circumstances. Atomic or nuclear ecology shouldn't be ruled out either. Needless to say, high gamma, alpha, or neutron radiation would generally be detrimental to life as those are prone to smashing up delicate and complex macromolecules like proteins or DNA or their non-carbon analogs, but it might be possible and such life would gain a very abundant power supply. However, beta radiation is another matter. It's a lot less deadly to life, and we discussed the notion of a diamond battery before, a diamond made out of carbon-14 rather than regular carbon, and while that obviously would be carbon-based, since carbon-14 is made by atmospheric processes combining a neutron with regular nitrogen-14, we could have worlds where carbon-14 was a lot more abundant and in which such diamond batteries might form naturally. Though it's a bit hard to imagine a geological process that would get you that carbon-14 buried down under enough pressure to form a diamond, then return it to the surface, given that while we say carbon-14 is a long-lived radioisotope, we are talking thousands not millions of years. Still, an abundance of carbon-14 is the important part, not that it specifically be in diamond form. Other radioisotopes as power sources might be viable for atomic ecology too. Such things would not be long-lasting, so either it has to have a natural source of replenishment, or be on very young worlds, left over from supernova nuclear synthesis producing short half-life materials. However, not only might that often be the case, especially in star clusters where things are packed together tighter than our local bubble of the galaxy, but time is a dubious concept with life. Time, in any meaningful sense, is about how much living you can get done. So for instance an ice-cored rock where life exists in liquid hydrogen might have all its chemical processes moving at just a percent of what they do here, and so life might be incredibly slow and long-lived, but that's problematic for evolution. Some world running at that effective biological speed might be far older than Earth but barely have reached simple multicellular life. Additionally worlds that are power-starved could still host life, but diversity in large food chains get harder because it's barely got a fraction of the power to run life that Earth does. For the same reason modern societies get more science done than older ones, we have more people to do research and also more people who can specialize and more narrowly, 
Low energy worlds would tend to have less biological niches and diversity for life to mutate and evolve in, and also have it all running slower. Presumably anyway. Again if it's life running on electricity then cold only helps with conductivity, and things might be running at far faster speeds than the slow chemical speeds of our own nervous systems or biology. As we mentioned, things running on short-lived radioisotopes might need to be on young worlds, but if the energy abundance for organisms is high enough, they might live and multiply and evolve quite fast. Robert L. Ford played with that notion a bit in his classic novel Dragon's Egg, where the natives evolve on a neutron star and everything is sped up to a ridiculous degree. The smaller your scale, the faster stuff happens, so anything based down more at the atomic and quantum scale, as opposed to the microscopic realm of cells and massive macromolecules, might run much quicker and with lower energy. Amusingly, they might be an exception to our normal Fermi Paradox assumption that all life that can master the science of interstellar travel would spread out. We can conceivably reach neighboring stars in a mere generation, to us, but if they live a whole life in what we call minutes, their trip would be millions of generations long and probably not attractive. On the flip side, ultra-slow life, like some critter slowly swimming around lakes of supercord methane or hydrogen, might find a conversation abrupt if it took only a few months. For them, interstellar travel and light lag on communications would be a minor irritation, but odds are also good they haven't had enough time to evolve into existence yet. Key notion though, once we leave behind the template of carbon-based life, We can't assume the biological or neurological processes happen on anything like our scale of time. They might experience a year's worth of life in minutes, or a minute's worth of life in years. There's no telling what might be possible for life yet, we lack the modeling capacity to even work with known biochemistry well enough to predict much about the function and behavior of carbon-based life, let alone the probabilities and characteristics of non-carbon life. I suspect though that they are very low. However, in centuries to come, we'll probably get much better at that, and I suspect we'll learn what the possible alternatives are for life on other worlds while we're here on Earth first, rather than by finding it digging around in other solar systems, simply from the long travel times to explore those worlds when and if we get the technology for interstellar spaceships. The first alien life we meet might be homegrown by us rather than discovered, On the other hand, until we actually get to places like Mars or Venus or Titan or Europa and dig around, we can't know if they are truly empty of life, and of course if we find it on any of those, especially if it is not carbon based, we could expect to find it all over the galaxy and in all sorts of odd varieties. All the more reason to get out there and explore, of course. Science fiction is full of strange aliens, but many authors only give glancing superficial looks at the topic of their biology or psychology. There are plenty of exceptions and one who does a particularly good job is Werner Vinge in his novel A Fire Upon the Deep, which gives us alien biology, hive mind psychology, and lots of post-biological life in a novel that's considered one of the great classics of sci-fi and he continues to bring forward powerful and thought-provoking ideas in the rest of his Zones of Thought series. Vinge is one of the big thinkers in science fiction, often presenting startling ideas and predictions, and if you'd like to try the series out you can find it on Audible. Audible has an amazing catalog of audiobooks and Audible members can choose three titles every month, one audiobook and two exclusive Audible originals you can't hear anywhere else, including access to news, original audio shows, and guided fitness programs. And since you can listen to your audiobooks anywhere on any device, and seamlessly pick up where you left off, they're great for commuting, running errands, or going to the gym. You can start listening today with a 30 day Audible trial, choose one audiobook and two Audible originals absolutely free. Just visit the link in the episode description, audible.com slash Isaac, or text Isaac to 500500. So next week we'll be looking at how trade and economics might look in the future, both here on Earth and out in space as we colonize the galaxy in economies of the future. The week after that we'll continue that discussion of what civilization might look like as we spread out to other worlds in genetic divergence and civilization. But before that we have a bonus episode airing this Sunday on the future not of humanity but our garbage. If you want to know when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you'd like to help support future episodes, you can visit our website, isaacarthur.net, 
To donate to the channel, check out our catalog of episodes or book recommendations, or buy some awesome SFIA merchandise. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.